Um, so the next, the next item in our agenda is, is, is our opening keynote address. And that will be by Hakeem Bello Osagi. Mr. Bello Osagi is one of the, he holds an MBA from the Harvard, Harvard Business School, a law degree from Cambridge University and an MA in politics, philosophy and economy from Oxford University. He's a member of the Nigeria Bar he, stands, he started his career as a petroleum economist and a lawyer. In over three decades, he has become a key player in the Nigerian economy through his participation in several businesses in the private sector, particularly in energy, finance, and telecommunications. So that, that's really just a little introduction to our, our opening address, our keynote address. Uh, Mr. Bello Sagi, I'd like you to welcome you to the stage. Uh, the, the topic of his discussion is defining success. So, so yeah, I hope we get to hear something more about his personal perspectives about this. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, It's nice to be back in Cambridge. As you can see, I was dressed for much warmer weather. <laughs> I came to this university 38 years ago, and they were two of the loveliest years of my life. My father, who was a gynecologist, was of the opinion that anybody who studied politics and philosophy was liable to become a dangerous, unemployed politician, and that any self-respecting individual had to have a profession. I was therefore ordered to study law. I therefore came to Cambridge and pretended to study law for two years Thankfully, the Cambridge examiners did not pretend to give me a degree, but actually gave me a real degree. I managed to get a law degree without having studied either land law or equity, which I now realize are the very heart of law. I spent my entire time in Cambridge as president of the Africa Society and very, very active in the affairs of Africa in the university. There were just 20 or 30 of us, 20 or 25 African students and 10, shall we say, lovers of Africa. And so I want you to know that it fills me with great joy to come back here and have an entire conference devoted to Africa, when 30 years ago, the entire Africa society could have met in a pub, and we sometimes met in a pub. So thank you very, very much for this invitation. I would like to congratulate the business school, and in particular, the director of the business school, for having founded this great place because when I was in Cambridge, there was no business school. And in fact, the notion that business or management was a subject was heavily disputed. I can remember very well telling my tutor that I was applying to business school, and he said to me, you are a very intelligent person. Why on earth would you be doing that? With great reluctance, he wrote my recommendation, and I am really surprised that I got in, given that he made some very nasty comments about business education in the recommendation. A few weeks ago, um, I was invited by Oxford University to speak at their business conference. They invited me on the same day as the European Cup final between Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid. 
and they actually had me make the closing address at the same time that Real Madrid was playing Atletico Madrid. I was full of apologies. When I checked the date when I would be speaking at Cambridge, I found that you had invited me on the same day that Italy was playing England. And I wondered what had I done to deserve this fate. I am delighted that you've invited me to open the conference <laughs> unlike Oxford University, and therefore I would have long finished and therefore will not need to compete against Stephen Gerrard and Wayne Rooney. <laughs> For this singular uh, courtesy and kindness, I want to assure you that at the boat race this year, I shall cheer for Cambridge against Oxford. <laughs> I want to be honest with you and tell you, that said, and thank you for invitation, that there's nothing I hate more than being invited to speak about success. And the reason for that is that I feel that there is something rather arrogant and overconfident when an individual stands up and tells you what the secret of success is. It somehow indicates that he thinks of himself as a very successful person, and he feels that he has the right to impart this information to you. The superstitious side of me often worries that having made this speech about great success, that something might happen to me in a couple of years' time, which leads you to wonder whether this speech shouldn't have been about the causes of failure as opposed to the secret for success. I've had the privilege of hearing the heads of BlackBerry, the heads of Nokia, the heads of Citibank all talk about the secret of successes, and you know what happened to them. So I therefore want you to allow me to simply share with you some perspectives coming from my own experience, which I want to share with you on how I've had to tackle some of the problems of business in Africa as opposed to giving you a lesson in success. Finally, I want to assure you that I want to speak very frankly because many of my friends and colleagues who I've heard speak about the causes or the reasons for their own success have often given speeches which I know bear absolutely no relationship with the reasons why they succeeded, but have said what they think they ought to say have been the reasons why they success, succeeded. They have invariably attributed to God, total focus, their undying determination, their great intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when in actual fact, the reasons are far more complex, complicated than that. And in all these things, there's a large element of luck that plays its role. That said, I want to divide my talk into three sections, a few minutes on defining success, a few comments on how, in fact, I <laughs> I'm chairman of a mobile phone company, so I hope you're on my network. <laughs> uh, I want to divide my talk into three portions, one talking a little bit about what success is not and what I think it is. The second portion to discuss what lessons I feel I've learned from trying to be a business success in Africa. And then the third portion is a personal discussion which I want to share with the younger members of this audience. Believing that the, for younger members, I mean everybody who is below 59 years of age. <laughs> Let me start by telling you what I think success is not. There are a large number of businesses in Africa which make large amounts of money. 
but ultimately they rest on a government created monopoly or they rest on government subsidies or they rest on a set of government relationships or they rest on a set of political favors given by a government. This is not just Africa. This is a characteristic of many emerging markets and a few, shall we say, emerged markets. Large sums of money are made from such businesses, but I would not define those businesses as successful. And the reason why I would not define those businesses as ultimately successful is that many of them do not or cannot stand the test of sustainability. And by that I mean it's arguable as to whether or not they would succeed if the monopoly was removed, if the subsidies went away, if a different government came into office or a minister or a president was removed. And it's very important that when we think of success in business, we appreciate the fact that many of institutions which make large amounts of money, in my view, are not genuinely business and economic successes. They may be political successes that make money, but they are not business successes. And, I, and I, while I appreciate that it often happens that a lot of businesses start off that way. It is of crucial importance that any business that you're in that begins like this alters its framework and understands that that advantage they have for a short period of time is in fact an advantage for a short period of time and therefore they have to begin to have a cost basis, a revenue basis, a strategy for diversification, which ensures that they can survive when those specific conditions are in fact changed. You often in business may not appreciate the degree to which you are dependent on a set of monopolistic or government relationships because it is not good for the ego to imagine that something that is going very well for you in financial terms is in fact resting on very shaky grounds. So for example, if you are a telecommunications company and you are the only player in the game, you effectively have a semi-monopoly as is the case in many countries, you really are not, in my view, a business success. And the very fact of being a monopoly or a semi-monopoly is likely to cause you to breed habits, to sustain behavior that, if anything, makes it difficult for you to face a harsh competitive situation or threat when that situation or threat emerges. If, for example, you are a bank and the bulk of your deposits come from government deposits, whether it be local, state, or the federal government, you are in the same position of not being competitive and not being able to sustain that success should the government take away those deposits. If you are in the import and export business and your business depends very much on the fact that you have found a way of ensuring that your competitors are in effect banned or that they have great difficulty of clearing your things through customs, you are not in a particularly different situation. So I do want to make the very important point for me which is that success is only success if it comes out of a business that satisfies a real or genuine need, not a manufactured need, is as a result 
of your doing well in a very competitive situation and is one that can be sustained by you irrespective of which government comes to power. And that, for me, is critical. Secondly, for long-term business success, in my view, it is of crucial importance that people in the private sector fully understand and appreciate that the overall political and social environment is of crucial importance because it is very difficult for business to survive and to succeed absent a successful political framework and absent a set of policies that ensure that the bottom half of the population can thrive, can live, can have their minimum social and economic and human needs satisfied because if this does not happen, you are, show, you are sowing the seeds for a social and political crisis which will inevitably happen. I, in my talks with uh, both students and young professionals, I continually emphasize the point that their environment counts and their participation in shaping that environment is of the utmost importance. Now, I, I speak a little bit about le some lessons I've learned from my own business career in tackling creating a successful organization. For most of you here, you've had a background in Europe and North America. Many of you are MBAs. And many of you, I presume, work in companies here. Therefore, what I'm going to say to you now will probably strike you as somewhat bizarre. I want to say that one of the first requirements and one of the first lessons I've learned is that you must have a healthy disrespect for something that you have been taught to respect, and that is data. All that you are taught is to acquire and accumulate as much data as possible and on the basis of data, fashion strategies. Most data that I've come across in my entire career in Africa has in fact been completely wrong. And there's nothing that is worse than to found a business on data that is just not correct. You're in fact far better off having a certain skepticism of this data and working, assuming that you don't have the data, than by resting your case on data that is not correct. My biggest failure in business was in the first mobile phone bid. I was working with a company called Orascom. Um, Nagib Sawires, a very successful businessman in Egypt. Every single piece of data that we had from some of the most prestigious consulting firms, from some great university research institutions, from very well-known stockbroking companies, all indicated that the Nigerian telephone market could not exceed 20 million subscribers. And in actual fact, if they got to 20 million subscribers, it would be a miracle. On the basis of that figure, we came to a maximum figure that we could bid in that auction. And that maximum figure was about $120 million. By the end of the first day in the bid, we had reached $200 million, and Nagib Sawares' chief financial officer was on the phone to him, and what he was saying to him very politely was, are you smoking something <laughs> by still being in the bid? We got to $250 million 
on the next day. And by this time, the stockbrokers had gotten in and were threatening to dump his stock. We exited at $265 million, and the winning bids came in at $285 million. Now that we know more about the Nigerian market, we realize that the value of that license was probably something close to seven or $800 million. But the basis of the analysis was on data that people, shall I just say, virtually invented, put in very nicely bound packages, which gave the illusion of an expertise that were not, was not there. I can still remember in my mind the night of the final bid, when Nagib was about to pull out. And I remember literally begging Nagib. And I said, Nagib, I know these figures are wrong because I'm chairman of a bank. And our biggest customer is a beer company. And I know how much beer is consumed by the Nigerian public. And I know that this statistic about the number of Nigerians living on $2 a day cannot be correct, because it would mean that they were all spending their money on beer. <laughs> I know, as chairman of a bank, the number of Nigerians who are smoking cigarettes, bad as it is. And I know that if there's a little bit of money left from the beer drinking, the number of Nigerians who are smoking cigarettes will consume what's left of that $2. And we haven't come to the fact that the bulk of Nigerians all own radios, all listen to music, and are therefore have the sales for music systems in Nigeria as well. But when you have something that has a very famous Western name at the bottom of a report, it's very difficult to argue, and therefore we exited. When I came to buying a bank, and the bank that I bought was United Bank of Africa, I had a very different attitude. At that time, the total cost of the bank was $15 million. I was told by many, again, of the experts, that what the data revealed was that Nigeria's customer base in banking was so small in terms of real money that it made no sense to buy a bank like this and that it was utterly ridiculous to think that given the bad debt profile of the company that this bank could ever be a success. This time I was on my own. I had no chief financial officer. I had no stockbrokers to call me up. My basic feeling was that the third largest bank in Nigeria, a country with a population of over $100 million, could not be worth $15 million. This must be a undervalued asset. I recall speaking to one of the largest South African banks at the time, who I asked to take the huge risk of putting in $8 million to buy 51% of the third largest bank in Nigeria, and then saying to me, that is a risk too much, $8 million. I want you to know that it was with great satisfaction that I went through with that transaction and it was with great satisfaction that I spoke to them several years ago when they made an offer to me that valued the bank at $300 million. I said, no. <laughs> All those banks that back in the mid-90s were valued of those figures now have valuations in excess of a, million, of a billion to two billion dollars. So when I tell you to have a healthy skepticism, disrespect for data, I mean what I say. 
The second lesson I've learned is a clear understanding about risk. Now, a lot of individuals and companies, especially international companies, they will speak to you about not wanting or being very concerned about Africa because it is very risky. What they really mean by that expression is that it is politically risky. Okay? And what they really mean by that is that they have switched on the television and they've heard about a coup in Mozambique or a famine that is going on in Ethiopia or that there's been a bomb blast in Nigeria or Kenya. That's what they really mean. I don't blame them given the paucity of information in the public domain. My response to all of this has been that the correct framework of analysis, if you want to succeed, is not political risk in and of itself. It is the total risk of the business. And that total risk includes market risk, technolog technological risk, political risk is part of it, but it is the total risk of the business. And while, for example, the political risk that I face in Africa may be higher than the political risk that somebody faces in Africa, in uh, Europe or in America, frankly speaking, the technological risk that I have in Africa is very low indeed. The first mover advantage that I have in most African countries is very low indeed. The chances, for example, that a new technology comes up from a business area that I do not regard as competing with me, and which happens over and over again in the United States and in Europe, hardly ever happens in Africa. The fun when you look at the volatility in the stocks in many American and European countries, the way in which, for example, Google and many other companies are employing disruptive technologies that are changing the face of competition, the risks that you face in a lot of other countries are far higher than you imagine, and they often, in my view, outweigh the lower political risks that you have in the Western world. Therefore, success in Africa needs a correct appreciation of political risk, not exaggerating it, not unduly worrying about it, and understanding that for me in the mobile phone business, or in the banking business, or in the consumer goods business, frankly speaking, the election in, an, in a country next year does not matter to me very much at all. The third point I'd like to share with you is the importance of being able to construct winning teams. And when I look back at my career, a fundamental aspect of failure and success has been the teams that are winning teams and that those that are losing teams. Let me try and share with you some of my concrete experience in that. Teams are crucial because they combine the talents, hopefully differing talents of different individuals, and they make the whole greater than the part. In a lot of companies or a lot of exercises that you will be engaged in, you'll be combining international uh, folks with locals. I'll talk first about the international guys. Time and time again, I've been in a business in which you just have, in blunt terms, the wrong foreign worker. 
And let me tell you what I mean by the wrong foreign worker. On one occasion, I had the CEO of a company. His wife, and I don't mean this in a sexist way, it could be his husband, really wanted to be in Paris. She had great visions of the Eiffel Tower. Nice trips to Chantilly. Dinner on the Seine. And her husband was sent to Lagos. <laughs> that he was to be the founding member of an oil trading company. I was his chairman. Once I had spent 15 minutes with her, I knew that that business was doomed. Every morning I saw him, he looked as if he hadn't slept the night before. And maybe he hadn't slept the night before. I'll often meet a foreigner who has a high degree, a high psychological need for structure, for certainty, for clear procedure, who, when he describes going to Germany, probably says, from England, probably says he's visiting Europe and not in Europe already. It's highly unlikely that however brilliant he is functionally, that he is going to do very well in an African country. When I work with foreign companies, I always ask to meet the, the husband and the wife, because they're a team. And I look for a person who may not necessarily be the best functionally, but a person that has a spirit of adventure, a hunger for new things. So that when the light packs up or the washing machine stops working, he or she doesn't throw their hands up and head for the airport. Now, you may think that these are very mundane issues, but you'll be surprised how much they affect people's productivity. That eagerness and desire to experience something that is new is more important than their functional intelligence. And I speak to their bosses because crucial to having this kind of foreigner on my team is the sense that the head office values and appreciates him. Hasn't thrown him out to Accra or Mombasa, where he is then in the political equivalent of Siberia in the Soviet Union, where he'll be forgotten by head office and all he hears from head office are the various promotions that are taking place of his colleagues who are in Washington, in London, or in head office. I constantly try to speak to his bosses to say, he needs to know that what he's doing is appreciated and that there is a clear path to success when he finishes in the country. For the locals, I find that there is a divide. And the divide often is, a bit similar to the foreign, foreign group, there's a divide between the local person, who usually has an MBA, who is usually foreign educated, very much like myself, who has a superb understanding of how life should be and a great incapacity to deal with life as it is in the country, and who doesn't want to deal with the guy or the lady who has been in Nigeria all their lives, has an intimate understanding of life as it is, life as it should be negotiated, and who in uh, colloquial terms, is street-wise. Winning teams inevitably are a, 
a combination of those who have lived in the country for long times, have worked the system as it is, understand, understand where all the bodies are buried, and those who have an understanding of how life could be, what new systems and technologies could be employed, and it is the creative and progressive interplay of these two different kinds of people in a team that make for success. I'd like to give you one example of another failure that I once, I've just had. This was a newspaper that many of you may have heard about. It was called The Next Newspaper. It was an outstanding editorial success. It was on the internet. It was very good, had very honest journalists. Its principal problem was that the gentleman in charge of marketing planned to set up a distribution system that basically hoped to compete against all the 15 and 20 year old guys who sell newspapers on all the streets of Lagos and against established channels. What happened the very next day when we opened up is that this brilliant newspaper was nowhere to be found because these young half-employed individuals made sure that it was nowhere to be found. To the brilliant MBA head of distribution, my comment was that the first lesson in, in an MBA class is that to set up a brand new distribution system is one of the most hazardous experiences that you can have. And that to run up against an established group of guys who have controlled this system for 40 years, however ineffective you think it may be, was frankly speaking an act of stupidity done on my cash while you are earning a salary and I am pissed off, to be very blunt. <laughs> That was a classic case of an American Canadian educated group of people disrespecting the local environment and the local staff who advised that it was wrong. The next point I want to emphasize to you is the fundamental importance of relationships. Because many emerging markets have institutions and laws that are weaker than those in America and in Europe, what that means is that personal relationships become more important or become as important or become very important depending on which specific country you are referring to. These relationships must be enhanced, must be encouraged, must be grown by anybody doing business in Africa all the time. You may not want to go for the CEO's daughter's naming ceremony. You may not want to go for his daughter's wedding, but I'll strongly advise you to go in your own interest. These relationships are fundamental. And they do not stop at five o'clock in the afternoon when you stop work, go home, and start what you regard as your private life. They go round the clock. The last two points I want to emphasize to you is a mental attitude, which is crucial. There's a great CD that is called The Fog of War. It is a film made by a great American Secretary of Defense called Robert McNamara. And he writes about the fog of war. And what he's talking about is he's saying very, very much that when you go into war, that it's like going, walking through a fog. You cannot see very clearly, precisely, what there is on the other side. I love that analogy because I think that 
one of the key factors for success in business is that you must have that mental attitude to walk boldly through the fog of uncertainty that is an inevitable part of business. There are some individuals who cannot make a decision until every single fact is in, who cannot live with uncertainty. By the time every single fact is in, you are inevitably too late for the opportunity. And therefore, a crucial element of your success is that ability to continue to walk boldly, notwithstanding that fog. The Spanish from Catalonia have a wonderful expression for it. It reads, the need for lucid daring. That's the ability to be daring, but while being conscious of the problems and the risks you know, that you have. La finally, I would like to simply say that your ability to have problems and setbacks is crucial because you will have setbacks, uh, schedules will not be met, and you will find yourself sometimes depressed and sad about that, but the ability to, for you to keep going is central. I'd like to end by making a comment, two comments to the younger ones in this audience. The first is the following. You all aspire to success. I want you to hear me out in saying that when you get to 59 years of age as I am, you will realize that your personal life, your, your sum of affections, your sum of personal relationships, whether these be with children, with nephews or nieces, or with young students of yours, are of fundamental importance to your overall success of your lives. Your relationship with another human being, whether that be a wife or a partner, or your parents, or with your family, are very important. I know many businessmen who are on the pages of newspapers and on the front pages of magazines who return to their lives and to their houses who are deeply unhappy. In your desire to be great successes, I want to urge you not to lose yourself. It is far easier to change a job, to change an industry, and to improve a business than it is to change an unhappy life. A few weeks ago, I got some news from my son who got into Stanford University. My oldest daughter went to Harvard. My second went to Princeton. My third went to Yale. I want you to know that that achievement for me, for my children, has, made, has given me greater happiness than any business success that I've ever had or any business success that I will ever have. And I have only been lucky to have achieved it by canceling many business meetings to watch my son play soccer or to watch my daughter have an African meal for all the students of her school. I urge you not to forget your personal lives. Finally, I want to say to you all, do not aspire to live dull and boring lives. Do not aspire to do what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to enjoy. Be mad and be bold. All the aspects in my own life have been things I have done that I have been told I am mad. I was, as a young person, told that you had to work in investment banking or you had to be a management consultant. I am none of these two, and I'm here before you today. Remember always, after all the accounting and the marketing, the words of a, 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 a great English poet. 
is one of my favorites, Yeats. And then the poet Frost, an American poet. Frost says, I saw a path going into the woods. I came to a place where two paths diverged. One path was not well trodden on. I took that path and it made all the difference. For Yeats, he says, gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Seize the times. Make your lives extraordinary. Good luck and God bless.